Okay, so get ready for this. Uh, picture a world where just like a little pat on the back could actually be fatal. Oh, wow. I know, right? And where a hug from your pet. Oh, no. Yeah. Could, could actually mean an early grave. Ugh. That's the kind of crazy world we're going to dive into today. A place where like, you know, misunderstandings are hilarious, power, you never know who really has it. And there's even like a hint maybe of romance. Ooh. Yeah. But, uh... Not exactly the, the hallmark kind, no. more like, you know, with a little bit of a dark twist. Sounds like we're going to be untangling a lot of threads here. Oh, absolutely. Where, where should we even begin? Well, I think the best place to start is with our, our main guy, Cray. Okay. Who seems to be made of, like, the most delicate porcelain. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think so. Like, even the slightest touch could just completely shatter him. Oh, wow. I know. A back pat. Like, lights out, game over. Oh, my gosh. And cuddles from his pet. Oh, by the way, the pet's name is Drink. Super cute, right? But cuddles from Drink. Instant, like, you know, respawn point. It's yeah. kind of like he's walking on eggshells constantly. Mm -hmm. it, it's a fascinating kind of observation, don't you think? Totally. It, it really makes you wonder if, like, this this fragility of his, it's not just physical. Right. Like, is it a metaphor? Is there some deeper vulnerability? Yeah. That, that we're not seeing yet. Exactly, and speaking of vulnerabilities, let's yep. talk about these two new characters that have just kind of waltzed into Cry's life. Okay. Liz and Citri. All right. Now they're both incredibly powerful, like no doubt about it, but their affections for Cry are, let's just say, intense. Intense how? Well, the term yonder gets thrown around a lot. Uh-oh. Yeah, and that's not exactly, you know, the term you associate with like, healthy, well-adjusted relationship. Right, right. And for those of us maybe not as uh, familiar with the term, what exactly does Yonder mean? Basically, think of it as a character type who's got this possessive, almost obsessive kind of love. Yep. Like, a love so intense it crosses over into, like, dangerous territory, you know? Oh, I see. So we've got our fragile protagonist surrounded by these individuals who, let's be honest, their romantic intentions could be a little concerning. Yeah. And here's where things get extra interesting, I think. The, the episode kind of hints that everyone, including Cry himself, might be totally misjudging how strong everyone around him really is. Oh, interesting. So, like, they're more powerful than they appear. Oh, way more. It's like watching a chess game, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the pawns are all secretly grandmasters. Like, take Citri, for example. Citri, okay. At first, she seems like the weakest of the bunch, right? Right. But then we see her just shrugging off attacks that, I mean should have obliterated her. Uh, like It's like she's got an invisible shield. She's got some secret power or something. Totally. And then there's Liz, who just casually dismantles this group of supposedly powerful bad guys. Yeah. While, uh, let's just say, enjoying some adult beverages. It's almost like she's holding back. Like she's toying with them. You know? I feel like just playing with them like a cat with a mouse. Exactly. It makes you think about those times in real life where like people are operating on a whole other level than they let on. Right, they're hiding their true power. Absolutely, like the saying, don't judge a book by its cover. I was, exactly. But let's not forget the whole financial drama going on too. Because Cry, apparently he's in some serious debt. Oh no. Yeah, and he's turned to Citri for, well, let's call it a unique kind of loan. What, what do you mean? Think of it as like the magical equivalent of maxing out all your credit cards. Oh geez. And to make it even more interesting, They've cooked up this scheme to convince others to basically foot the bill for cries, let's just say, extravagant purchases. Oh, so they're scamming people. Kinda. All under the guise of, like, training to catch up to this mysterious figure named Lucia. Lucia, okay. So who is Lucia? Well, that's the thing. She's Cry's sister. His sister. Yeah. And get this. The episode is hinting that she might be the most powerful magic user around. Why? Really? Yeah, and the reason why is because apparently she's the one constantly recharging Cry's magical relics. Oh, wow. It's played for laughs, but it does make you wonder about their whole dynamic, you know? It seems a little one-sided, maybe. Right. Like, yeah. is Cry totally oblivious to the burden he's putting on his sister? Or is there something deeper going on? Maybe he's taking advantage of her. Maybe. It's one of those intriguing ambiguities that keeps you hooked, right? Definitely. And as if things weren't wild enough already, we get this completely random cameo from a character named Morusama. Oh, Morusama. Yeah, Morusama. Just out of nowhere. No explanation, no context, just poof. There they are. Hmm. That's, that's strange. It's like the writers are saying, hey, 
Pay attention, there's more to this world than you think. They're dropping hints. Don't. Teasing us. Exactly. All right. Okay, so we've got a fragile main character who, who knows, maybe he's not so fragile. Powerful love interests. But with this, Yonder Edge, a potentially, let's be honest, kind of exploitative sibling relationship, and a random cameo that just throws everything for a loop. Right. And we haven't even scratched the surface of the real power dynamics at play here. This is this is a lot to unpack. Oh, absolutely. This episode is like a beautifully crafted illusion. How so? Well, because it, it, everything we think we're seeing, it's yeah. constantly being challenged. What you see is rarely what you get. Oh, I see. So nothing is as it seems. Exactly. And that brings us to like one of the most mind-blowing parts of this whole episode. Yeah. The difference between how strong people seem and how strong they actually are. Okay, so tell me more about that. Well, so remember that scene with, with Gark? Gark, yeah. Like, seemingly harmless dude. Right, right. Seemed like a pretty normal guy. Yeah, totally. But that back pat he gives Cry, I mean, that was enough to, like, set off Cry's safety ring. Yeah. You know, like, the magical version of an airbag. Yeah. Oh, wow. So that seemingly innocent gesture was actually super powerful. Exactly. It's like the episode is telling us, hey, pay attention. There's more than meets the eye here. And we see that same theme of hidden strength with with Liz. Liz. When she runs into the fallen mist. Right. Those guys, they were supposed to be like super tough, right? Yeah, they were hyped up as these formidable opponents. But Liz, even though she's clearly had a few, she just takes them apart effortlessly. (laughs) Wow. Like it was nothing to her. Yeah, like she's a master chef chopping vegetables. But instead of vegetables, it's these trained warriors. That's that's pretty impressive. Right. And then there's Sea Tree. Sea Tree. Immune to drinks deadly cuddles. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. So Drink, who's basically a walking hazard for Cray, right. snuggles up to Sea Tree, no problem. No problem at all. So how's that possible? Are they just built different? Or is there something something more going on? Maybe even something protecting Cray? It's like they're all wearing these weighted vests, you know? Yeah, I get it. Pretending to struggle with everyday things. But secretly, they're like... Super powered beings. It's kind of funny, yeah. but also kind of creepy, don't you think? Yeah, a little bit. But this whole idea of hidden strength, it also makes me think about Cry's sister, Lucia. Lucia, yeah, the super powerful one. Right, but the thing is, the episode seems to suggest that her power comes with a cost. And Cry doesn't seem to notice. So, what do you mean a cost? Well, it's implied that Lucia is constantly draining her own magical energy just to recharge Cry's relics. It's like, a magical energy vampire. <laughs> oh, what? A magical energy vampire just sucking the power out of her without even realizing it. Wow, that's that's a bit harsh, isn't it? It's played for laughs, but it does make you think about their relationship. Oh, yeah, it does. Is Cry really that clueless? Yeah. Or is there a chance, maybe, that he knows what he's doing? Like, he's using her. That's, that's an interesting thought. It would make him a lot less sympathetic. Right. And speaking of complicated relationships, let's talk about the tension brewing between Liz and Seatree. Oh, yeah, those two. Definitely seems like there's something going on there. They both want cry, and it's getting heated. Like, faster than a cauldron over an enchanted flame. Don't forget, they're both yonders. Right. And that's not a recipe for a healthy love triangle. Yeah, love triangles are never easy, but when you add in the yonder element, things can get a little messy. Messy is an understatement. Right. It's like a rom-com, but set in a haunted house. Yeah. You're laughing, but you're also waiting for the other shoe to drop. Right. And then there's that scene where Sea Tree actually steps in and stops Liz from getting too close to cry. Not very subtle, is it? No, not at all. A clear sign of possessiveness. A classic yonder move. Like, back off, he's mine. <sighs> but what's interesting is that Liz doesn't seem surprised at all. Right. Later, she even makes a comment about Sea Tree being possessive while she's uh, enjoying a few enchantments, let's say. So what do you think she's doing? Is she just playing along, or is there something more going on? I think she's playing a game, testing the boundaries, maybe even enjoying the challenge. Like, she's a master strategist, always a few moves ahead. That's a good point. She doesn't seem to be reacting, more like she's in control, orchestrating the whole thing. Exactly. And then there's all the financial stuff going on in the background, Yeah. cries debt, those mysterious artifacts he keeps buying, that crazy scheme to get other people to pay for it all. It's like this big, tangled web of intrigue. It feels like we're putting together a puzzle. Each piece we find makes the picture more complex, more interesting, but also more confusing. And just when we think we've got a handle on things, boom. Yeah. Random cameo from Barusama. Out of nowhere. No explanation, no context, just 
There they are. Yeah. What do you make of that? I don't know. It's so strange. It could be a red herring. Or maybe it's a clue to something bigger going on. Like a whole other story happening beyond what we're seeing. It's those little details that make you want to go back, rewatch everything, and try to find all the hidden meanings. Okay, so where are we now? We've got a possibly manipulative protagonist, powerful love interests who might be playing mind games with each other, a mysterious sister who's keeping everything running, and enough financial shenanigans to make your head spin. Plus, a random cameo that's either a joke or a major plot point. It's a lot to take in. It is, but that's what makes this episode so good. It's funny, it's action-packed, and it keeps you guessing the whole time. I'm definitely hooked. What happens next? Well, the final part of this episode is about to get really wild. We're diving even deeper into magic, mystery, and the tangled relationships between these characters. Sounds exciting. Buckle up. This deep dive is about to go to a whole other level. Okay, so all those magical artifacts Cry keeps buying, you know, the ones that need constant recharging. Yeah. Well, this episode kind of subtly reveals who's actually been footing the bill for all that magical energy. Oh, right. Lucia, right. It's almost like she's running this magical power grid and cries her, like, biggest energy hog. Exactly. The episode plays it for laughs, but it does make you think, like, how long can Lucia keep this up? without completely burning herself out. And what happens when she hits her limit? Right, good point. It's kind of like cries this magical parasite, right? Just draining his sister dry without even realizing it. Kind of a harsh way to put it, don't you think? Well, maybe, but there's another thought I had. What if he does know? What if cries actually aware of what he's doing to Lucia, but just chooses to ignore it? Oh, interesting, so you're saying he might be taking advantage of her. Yeah, it adds a whole other layer to his character, you know. Makes him a little less innocent. Definitely. It makes you reevaluate their whole dynamic. Totally. And speaking of, you know, characters who might be a little less innocent than they seem, did you catch that scene with Liz when she mentions the Akashic Records? The Akashic Records. Refresh my memory. Okay, so imagine like a giant cosmic library, right? Okay, I'm following. And it has all the knowledge of the universe, past, present, future. That's basically the Akashic Records. Oh, wow. That's pretty heavy stuff. It is. And for some reason, Liz seems to have a connection to them. She even accuses Citri of being involved in some kind of Akashic incident. <laughs> but they never really explain what that means. So we've got cosmic libraries now and secret incidents. Right. On top of everything else. Right. Every time you think you've figured this episode out, there's another layer. It's like a puzzle box. Exactly. But before we go too far down the rabbit hole with all that, I want to circle back to Liz and Citri. Specifically that scene where Liz is, well, let's just say not fully dressed. And she doesn't seem to care at all that Cry might see her. Oh yeah, that was interesting. Most people would be mortified, but she was completely unfazed. It's like they're so comfortable with each other that it's not even awkward. And then of course Sea Tree comes barging in. Right, classic Sea Tree. Gotta protect what's hers. Yonder alert. Red. Oh, absolutely. But the thing is, Liz doesn't even react. Later on, she even makes a comment about Sea Tree being possessive while she's uh, enjoying a few enchantments, let's say. Okay, so what's Liz's game then? She seems to be playing it pretty cool. I think she knows exactly what she's doing. Like, she's fully aware of Citri's uh, tendencies, and she's using it to her advantage. Ooh, that's good. It's like she's always one step ahead. Exactly. So to recap, we've got a potentially manipulative protagonist, yonder love interests, who are playing mind games, a mysterious sister holding everything together, and enough financial schemes to make your head spin. Oh, and a random cameo that might mean something, or might not. It's a lot to process. It is. But that's what makes this episode so great. It blends humor, action, and this really cool psychological tension. It leaves you questioning everything. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to rewatch this one. Me too. It's a world where power is constantly shifting. What you see is never what you get. Right. And those seemingly innocent things could be hiding some seriously dangerous secrets. Exactly. So as you go back to your own life, dear listener, keep that in mind. The quiet ones are often the most powerful, and sometimes the most harmless gestures are the ones you need to watch out for. Oh, and one last thing. Never underestimate the power of a good cuddle. It could be more dangerous than you think. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep diving deep. <laughs>